it's a pleasure to be here with you and thank you for the great lunch that you guys all made. It was terrific. We should give all the cooks a clap, I think. Thank you. <laughs> so this is a talk I gave at VegFest Oahu this year. Um, it's a lot of brand new information, um, quite shocking, so I'm quite um, you know, happy that I've got this opportunity to come and share this with you because it's really important that you not only learn it yourself but take it home, share it with other people and get change to happen because the only way we can make change happen is if you share the information and everyone takes action. And at the end of this talk, well, I'm going to talk for about 20 to 30 minutes. We are starting a little bit late, so I hope you can stay because um, lots of important information. Um, and then um, we're going to have time for some questions and answers at the end, a discussion, and um, do some action items, actually. Uh, and Cynthia from Surfbrider will be saying a few words as well at the end. All right, so let's get started. So we're going to be covering um, a few different topics. Plastic pollution of our planet, plastic chemicals and health implications, the migration of chemicals into food and drinks, hot filling and more, the truth exposed. This is the new information that I just learned myself in July this year. Um, persistent organic pollutants, why not to eat seafood, taking action, plastic reduction solutions. So this is the action part and we're going to have a discussion and questions and answers as I mentioned. Okay, this is why the ocean needs our help. This is a photograph I took of and a beach that people call the world's dirtiest beach. It's at Camillo. It's about seven miles north of South Point on the Windward side. And this is like a river of plastic coming down. It's just absolutely shocking and it stinks. So it smells nauseating. <laughs> you know, you almost vomit when you see it. Yes. Yes. This is Hawaii Island, big island seven miles north of South Point, the southernmost tip of the United States, and known as the world's dirtiest beach. And, and this is why we need to do something about this plastic problem. This is Oahu, um, and we didn't pile this up, the ocean did. This is just as we found it, all right? This is, again, Camillo Beach at sunrise. And Dean, who's standing right there with the co-founders of the organization, we're all volunteer, not paid. Um, we removed over four million pieces of plastic from this beach over two days, working from sun up to sundown without just continuous. Um, and this is what it was like when we started, it was one foot deep in plastic. So this is the timeline um, of plastic production um, from the 1950s up to 2015. And as you can see, there's not much going on in 1950 and 1960. It pretty much got going in the 1970s. So this is a problem that's happened in our lifetimes pretty much, right? And it's a problem that we can all fix if we take um, action now, you know, before it's too late. And you know, I, I remember the days when there wasn't all this plastic stuff. Maybe you do as well. So I went and researched it and I thought, well, when did these things start? And you've got plastic um, peat bottles for soda and so on. 42 years ago in the 1970s, also plastic straws were back then. Plastic checkout bags didn't come in until 1982. I'm really glad you guys don't have those here. Kawhi's done a super good job of getting rid of those. Well done. Um, and in the 90s, the mid-90s was when those plastic microbeads started getting put in scrubs and then they put them in toothpaste and other things like that. Um, and then the plastic water bottle, look at this, 1994. I mean, that's not that long ago, right? Um, and then we've got pods. The dishwashing pods were introduced in 2003 and the Tide pods for washing your clothes, 2012. So that's only a few years ago that people started using these harmful plastic things. And the point of showing you all of this is that, you know, we can go back to what we used to use. We don't have to be using all this plastic stuff, right? Um, and this is what's going to happen if we don't stop. They're projecting this 
going up and up and up and up. This is the scale of plastic usage. What is actually occurring is that now more people are using um, the hybrid cars and, and the, um, what, what, what are the uh, electric vehicles. There's less gas being used for that. And so now they're trying to ramp up the plastic production. And we've got to not let that happen. Don't you agree? And really and truly, this is crazy because a lot of people these days know about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Who knows about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch here? Who's ever heard of that thing? Okay, great. So why, why are we now getting vinyl fences? Why is that going on? Why is the styrofoam going on roofs? That's what's happening at our house. Not our house, but where we live. We're the only ones saying no to styrofoam on our roofs and vinyl on the fences. But why more plastic? It should be less plastic, not more plastic. And guess what? Oahu, they put in plastic grass in nine medium areas around the island. And when we went to see the, um, env the environmental, whatever they're called, the services person in the city, they said, oh, guess what? Kauai wants to put it in all their parks. Did you guys know that? <laughs> Boo, all right. <laughs> The mall, right. Well, apparently the county was considering putting plastic grass in all over the place here. So keep an eye on that. Make sure that never happens, please, you know, because that's just terrible. All right, so, you know, plastic lasts forever. Um, you might have heard of those timelines, like 500 years for this plastic bottle and 1,000 years for whatever it is. No, <laughs> okay? Forget those timelines, those are wrong. The real timeline for plastic is plastic lasts forever. It does break into smaller and smaller pieces or you could say it breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces, but it's never gonna go away. You're gonna end up with plastic dust on our planet forever, all right? And that's the real timeline for plastic. These are fragments of plastic at a beach. Now, this could be any beach on the windward side of the whole Hawaiian island chain. Who's seen this on the windward side? Right, you guys have it too. Every single island has this. And it's mostly white and blue because the marine life are eating the bright colors. And this is the leftover, what's washing ashore after they've eaten the rest. Yes? Um, Moloa Beach, the current comes from Japan, so there's a lot of Yes, yeah, so, um, and Japan's one source, and there's lots of sources of marine debris, um, and, and it's the windward sides because of those currents that are hitting those shores. Um, so, anyway, this was at Hanama Bay, um, but this is kind of what got me started, was I was going for a walk at Waimanolo Bay with Dean, and we came across all this little tiny plastic, and I was horrified because I thought, how are we going to clean that all up? There's no vacuum cleaner. There's no plastic magnet. Like, how are we going to remove all of this tiny stuff from the beach? And, you know, it's just an enormous environmental disaster happening in our lifetime. And what about in the water? I mean, how do you clean that up? You know, it's pretty much impossible, right, to get it all out of there. Um, and, and that's why we're looking at a huge crisis. This is the water sample. That's my hand with, with the plastic all over it, um, you know, from Hanama Bay, which is a marine preserve. So you wouldn't expect to see this, would you? But this is what's coming out of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and accumulating in our near shore waters and on our um, beaches. Now, at least the science is starting to catch up with the problem. Um, and you may have heard this in the news about the average person ingesting approximately five grams of plastic a week or a credit card. Have you guys heard about those, those statistics? Maybe not. Um, but this is the sources of it. So they're looking at um, you know, the, the credit card of plastic a week being 100, well, sorry, 1,769 pieces in drinking water, 182 if you eat shellfish. Um, 10 in beer and 11 in salt. So this is what they're saying the average person consumes every week of plastic. Um, let's look at one of the studies. So this one was 259 bottles of water across 11 brands and they found 93% of those bottled waters contained some kind of microplastic contamination. 
um, and an average of 325 microplastic particles per liter. So that's quite a lot. Uh, let's look at this one. This was 159 samples, this time of tap water. Um, they also looked at beer and they looked at salt and they found debris in each brand of beer and salt. Um, and they found 81% of tap water samples contain particles. All right. So that result indicated the average person ingests over 5,800 particles of plastic um, from those sources annually, which with the largest coming from tap water, which was 88%. Is that all over the United States? Is that like a... Yes, we're going to look at that. So here we are. Um, this is globally, all right, and you can see the percentage of tap water samples that contain plastic. The U.S. had 94.4%, the highest, um, or not quite the highest. We had over here, Lebanon, it was 98%. So it was the second highest percentage of tap water samples containing plastic. Um, these were plastic fibers, all right? Is this shocking? <laughs> you guys sound, yeah. All right. Now, oh, wait, we need to move this back a little bit. Back or forward, Dean? All right, there we go. Okay, now this is really recent. This, is, this one study is 25th of September 2019. This is this year, all right? And and these results are totally staggering. They took a plastic tea bag. I didn't even know they were making plastic tea bags until I was on a plane last year. And they said, do you want some tea? And I said, OK. And then they give me this plastic packet with a plastic tea bag inside. I mean, goodness gracious, when did that start? And anyway, so they put a single plastic tea bag in some hot water. And it released 11.6 billion microplastics and 3.1 billion nanoparticles into the water. And that is the highest rates of, of plastic coming out of anything that they've ever found. What was your Why question? Did you drink the tea on the planet? Oh, I didn't even have it. No, no. <laughs> Good, goodness, no. <laughs> I brought it back as a sample to show an outreach. But yeah, I mean, no one should be buying plastic tea bags and putting in hot water. I mean, this is, this is shocking. Okay, well, this is what the plastics industry thinks about this whole issue. Um, this is the American Plastics Council. And they are announcing that plastic is an important part of your healthy diet. And it's the sixth food group. <laughs> this is serious, by the way. This wasn't a joke, you know, that, I mean, I put it in for you guys to laugh. But, but really, this was printed in National Geographic. Mm -hmm. And here's some more um, misinformation from the plastics industry. This is what they do. They do a lot of this propaganda. This is the um, Plastics Industry Association, and they're promoting single-use plastics as better than reusable items, okay, with a so-called smaller environmental footprint. And there's one more misinformation here, and that is calling forks single-use. Don't you agree? Plastic forks. I saw you guys today, you were cleaning the, the red plates, right? And reusing the plastic plates. Right, that's what we all did. I don't know if you remember, but I remember when we had parties and we had plastic plates or plastic cups and plastic utensils, it would never be wasted. It would all go back to the kitchen and get washed and put away and reuse for the next time that you had a big party, right? Because nobody wasted money like that and you don't want to make a lot of garbage, right? So we need to stop calling these things single use because they are not single use. Would you agree? Yeah. Yes, okay. Now, this problem is so bad that it's even in the air we're breathing, all right? So they've actually gone to places like the Pyrenees in France and found um, plastic in the air there as well in studies. Now, not only is plastic made from oil, and that's bad enough because that's a fossil fuel, it took millions of years to form, and then someone may or may not use the item again and throws it away, what a waste, but it's also made with chemicals. So every single plastic item that you ever buy contains one chemical or another. 
So we're going to look at some of those chemicals today so that you're aware of them. And I'm also going to be giving you this plastics handout. I know some of you have got it already. Um, and it's going to give you a good rundown on those chemicals and that information in there. Now, we'll start with a couple you might have heard of, bisphenols. They make plastic hard, phthalates, they make plastic soft. Um, you've got flame retardants, so it doesn't catch on fire. Um, and we're going to look at some of the rest of those right now. All right, now, a clear plastic bottle, all right, or a number one bottle, the kind of bottle that's used for water, is um, PETE, or polyethylene terephthalate ethylene. Big long word. Just remember Pete and one. All right, now this contains the chemical antimony, which is the suspected carcinogen. Polystyrene, that is like styrofoam, all right? Styrofoam cups, plates, and so on. Um, this leaches the chemical styrene, which is toxic to your brain and nervous system and has adversely affected the blood, liver, kidney, and stomach in animal studies and red blood cells, all right? So you don't want to be eating your hot food like this out of polystyrene because you're getting your Chinese takeout with your dose of chemicals along with it. What's that? And styrene has been, unfortunately, it's been found by the US EPA in 100% of Americans have styrene in their bodies. All right. Now, bisphenol A, you may have heard of BPA. It's a chemical that mimics the human hormone estrogen. All right. And it leaches from polycarbonate plastic. So you don't want to be drinking any water out of this. And you see these all over offices and things like that. But you're going to be getting traces of that chemical. BPA was made as a... Um, sex hormone drug in the 50s, and then they saw, oh, look, it hardens plastic. Let's shove it in some baby bottles and put it in these kind of sport water bottles and, and water dispensers. Um, and this chemical acts at very low doses, all right? So you really don't want to be drinking out of that. Um, the, the measurements um, that have been done in this study of BPA, they found it was found in 95% of people tested in the U.S., and BPA is also found on cash register receipts. You know the shiny ones? Yeah, you want to um, wash your hands after handling that and before eating and drinking. BPA is linked to breast cancer, prostate cancer, obesity, and diabetes. And it's even found in the lining of canned food and drinks. Now, BPA has a, a bunch of different health effects, um, as I mentioned. Um, but it also can be directly related with PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. They found that um, there was a direct association with that, that women had higher levels of BPA um, that had PCOS than women who didn't have it. Now, BPA is just one of at least 20 different types of bisphenols being used. Um, so we might as well just pick an alphabet letter and shove it at the end because what they're doing now is they're substituting the BPA for BPS or BPF or BPC, B, E, you know, we'll just keep going with the alphabet. Um, ChemTrust actually did a whole report on this about how companies are just replacing one harmful BP something <laughs> with another harmful BP, take a pick of an alphabet letter. Um, so that's the trick that's going on at the moment. Um, so they did some tests on different types of bisphenols in children, and they found that BPA was found in 97.5% of kids, BPS was found in 87.8, and BPF was found in 52.2% of urine samples of children and adolescents. Now, all numbers of plastic one to seven contain chemicals that cause estrogenic activity. So there's no such thing as a safe plastic, not number five, not Tupperware, not any, any kind of plastic. So all numbers, including all the bisphenol ones, even if it says BPA free, they probably put BPS in it instead. All right, so don't get tricked by that one. 
Now, what is estrogenic activity? Well, we need to quickly talk um, a little bit about um, the endocrine system. So the endocrine system is a series of glands that produce hormones, and it includes the pituitary, thyroid, adrenal, and reproductive glands. And these hormones regulate various functions such as metabolism, sleep, growth, development, and reproduction. And they influence almost every cell, organ, and function in our body. So in other words, they're very, very important, um, the endocrine system. Now, the disruptors, they interfere with your hormonal system. They mimic the naturally occurring hormones, pretending to be like them and act like them. And they interfere or block the natural hormones from being made or, or muck around with their functioning. They can bind to receptors within cells, blocking the hormones from binding. So that means the fake one binds, but the other one doesn't. And that can then stop normal signals from occurring, and therefore the body will fail to respond. Now, these endocrine disruptors affect the brain, the nervous system, the immune system, the thyroid, metabolism, adrenal glands, sex hormones, reproduction, and sex ratio balance, resulting in heart conditions, thyroid conditions, prostate and breast cancer, obesity, diabetes, low sperm count, the feminization of male species in invertebrates like fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, or the masculinization of females. It can even turn on or trigger autoimmune diseases. And look at this um, timeline for sperm decline from the 1970s to 2010. They've seen a 52.4% decline um, in sperm count. And that's interesting, don't you think? Because that's about the same timeline as the plastic timeline. <laughs> you know, in the 1970s was when we started using all of this plastic. A lot of this stuff takes time, right? A lot of these side effects are over time. That's true, they are. That's right, they are. So we're going to talk now about what causes the plastic to the chemicals, sorry, to migrate from the plastic into the food and drink. Now, one, there's various different things that happen. So every plastic item contains chemical additives that are physically there, but they're not chemically bound to the plastic. That means there's a weak bond, all right? So that makes, that's one of the reasons that the chemicals can migrate. Secondly, food composition, the more fat in the item, the more, um, the higher the migration, and also acidic foods and drinks can also cause a higher migration of the chemicals out of the plastic item. Time. So how long has that thing with your food or drinks been sitting in the container, either on the shelf or in the store or in the warehouse? Um, that has an, an effect on the timeline. Also, if the food is closer to the expiration date, that means there is going to be a larger amount of chemicals in the package. And the, the sorry, larger amount of chemicals in the food and a smaller amount of chemicals in the package because they migrate from it. And lastly, heat. So you'd never want to put anything plastic in the microwave, all right, because the heat will cause the migration of the chemicals or leaving plastic in the sun. So this is a really bad idea, um, is transporting the water bottles on the truck. Now, of course, living in Hawaii, a lot of stuff comes here from the mainland, right? So it's on a boat in the heat for like five days. Then it's on the dock in the heat, on the truck in the heat, outside the store in the heat, and then finally it's cooled off and it's in the supermarket, right? but it's had all those times that it's been heated up to release that chemical antimony like I was speaking up about before. But that's not the only ways that the, um, the chemical migration from heat occurs. And this is the shocking part that I learned just recently. And that is that these kinds of bottles and every other plastic bottle that's um, number one, such as these, so we've got ketchup and tea and honey and mango juice and so on. These are hot filled. They actually fill it up at a really high temperature. 
it's 90 to 95 degrees Celsius, and sorry, I have to look up what that is in Fahrenheit, 194 to 203 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes, they're heating up the, the item in the bottle to sterilize the bottle, and then to sterilize the cap, they tip it on the side and leave it there, okay? And we even talked to people who worked in Pepsi, and they said they don't even cool the bottles down, they just put them in the side of the warehouse somewhere and it cools down over months. Mm -hmm. so, beside, so these are the kinds of things that are hot filled into plastic. Fruit and vegetable juices, flavoured waters, isotonic beverages, that's kind of like your Gatorade, honey and nectars, ready to drink teas, marinades, soups, spreads, and this is not even a complete list, here's some more. Mayonnaise, pasta sauce, jams. Are you guys shocked? Yeah. <laughs> I was. Oil might be. I'm not really sure, but I wouldn't want to buy it in plastic. That's for sure. Well, actually, oil. Yes, oil is um, uh, fatty, right? It's oil, right? So that'll pull the chemicals. Yes, so you don't want to ever buy oil in plastic, for sure. Now, listen to what the industry has to say about this. Industry experts point to shifting consumer demand from carbonated soft drinks to healthier drinks like juices, teas, and enhanced waters that are hot-filled. What do you guys think about that? That doesn't sound healthy to me. Do you think? Hot-filled? No, thank you. I don't think so. All right, and we're not done with this stuff because this is the next thing that I learned. Oh, my gosh. Tetra packs. I mean, doesn't this look like just cardboard? Yeah. Cardboard, right? Well, guess what? It's lined with polyethylene plastic, the same number one plastic. It's like you're buying a water bottle when you buy that pack. Uh-huh. And this is heated to a high temperature as well. Same thing. And it includes all these things, all the nut milks, the coconut waters, you name it, soups, you know, things like this. So this is what a Tetra Pak looks like. It's got Tetra Pak on the bottom. I mean, gosh, I was buying those things right up until July. Um, as soon as I found out, I just stopped. But do any of you guys have any of these at home? Have you been buying this? Yeah, so we're going to have to do something about this, don't you think? So we have action for you to take at the end of this today, all right? So don't worry, we're going to do something about this. All right, but it doesn't stop there because look here. <laughs> oh no, did someone say, oh boy, okay. Looks yummy, right? Looks good, yeah? Where, and being a vegan, you know, you look at it, you read the labels a lot when you're a vegan, right? And it says non-GMO, it says gluten-free, it says plant-based, it says soy-free. Sounds pretty good. Let's take a look at this one. This one says gluten-free, non-GMO, vegan, and organic. Sounds healthy, right? Guess what? Unfortunately, it's not. And the reason why, you know, I mentioned phthalates earlier. Those are things that make things soft. There's phthalates in the packets. And when they're finished cooking, say, you know, this was, um, what is this? Cookies, right? They, heat, they bake the cookies. Then they get the packet straight in. So it's either hot or warm into the packet. And that's how the chemicals are coming into the food. And think about other things, chips, corn chips. Um, roasted nuts, granola, any of those items that are being cooked, baked, heated, roasted, something's happening to them that they get heated up in some way, they don't cool them down, they go straight into those packets. Okay? So, Aren't again... They aluminum, kind of like shiny inside? Is that what we're talking about, that kind of packaging? Any of those packets that are made of plastic. Yeah. Okay, so um, here are some of the health effects of phthalates. 
reproductive problems, endocrine ones, fetal, um, they affect fetal development, obesity, cancer, again, diabetes, immune system problems. It's no wonder that so many people today have autoimmune diseases or cancers on the rise. I mean, it's just, it's not a surprise when you're looking at this kind of information, don't you think? Yeah. And what about this? When people eat out, they've found that people have higher phthalate levels than if you eat at home. So if you eat out, it's 35 to 55 percent higher phthalates. Now, I was reading something online, I forget um, which restaurant it is, but this um, waiter filmed the process of heating up the mac and cheese. They get a plastic packet of mac and cheese, one serving, and they stick it in a pot of boiling water in the plastic. Yes, and then they cut it open and stick it in the plate, and that's how they serve it. So this is no wonder that, you know, it's 55% higher phthalates when you eat out. You don't know if they're heating it in plastic in a pot. You don't know if they're microwaving it in plastic. Um, you just don't know what's going on with the food, unfortunately. And look at this. I mean, this is a kind of a newer thing, right? Kids, yeah, these are for babies, right? And it's all plastic and phthalates and it's likely, I'm sure it's put in there hot. You know, they hot fill that as well. And you're probably thinking by now, well, why isn't the government protecting us? You know, wouldn't you think they'd not allow this? Well, there's 84,000 chemicals on the market and only about 1% have been tested for safety. Um, and so they're just letting this happen, unfortunately. And today, the exposures are starting in the womb. So whatever the mother's chemical body burden is, she's actually passing on 50% of her body bur burden of chemicals to the firstborn child. And that makes them more susceptible to diseases, either earlier or later in life, but not only that, this is an intergenerational problem. The DNA damage that occurs from the womb will affect not only that child's children and their grandchildren, their great-great-grandchildren as well, all right, just from the exposures in the womb. So to some extent, we've got babies being born pre-polluted in today's world. Sad, huh? Now let's return to the marine debris issue. So plastic in the ocean accumulates persistent organic pollutants, or POPs, up to one million times more concentrated on the surface of the plastic than in the surrounding seawater. Now POPs are persistent organic pollutants. These are things like DDT and DDE that were banned a very long time ago, but they still exist in the ocean and they accumulate onto plastic. So plastic is acting like a sponge in the ocean. Now these PCBs and DDT and DDE are accumulating on top of plastic that already contains chemicals like we were mentioning, like the BPA and the phthalates and so on. So these, all of these types of chemicals cause endocrine disruption and they accumulate up through the food chain. All right, And the animals at the highest um, level get the, uh, sorry, animals at the highest, um, at the top of the food chain get the highest levels of endocrine disruptors in their fatty tissues. Now, these are, this is a photo that I've taken of plastic from the ocean that's been eaten by marine life. And this is your evidence that fish are eating plastic. Now, remember what I just said about chemicals. So when they eat the plastic, they're getting chemicals. So if you're looking at your fish at home and opening it up, um, and here's some lanternfish, which Al Goleta Marine Research Foundation opened up, and they found plastic in 35% um, of the fish, up to 25 pieces per fish. All right, now you can see the white and blue there. But if you go home and open up a fish, you may not see the plastic, but there'll be the chemicals. The chemicals go into the fatty tissues and bioaccumulate. So you would have to have your fish tested chemically to know if it's safe to eat or not. Now, this study here um, found that out of um, 233 fish 
from seven different species, they found 73% of those fish had plastic in their gut, and one type of fish um, had a, an ingestion rate of 100%. So every fish in that species had plastic. Um, looking at the plankton photos here, you can see plastic in the gut and plastic in the fecal pellets, and you're probably thinking, oh good, <laughs> the plastic got pooped out by the plankton. Well, no, like I said before, it's the chemicals we've got to be concerned with. Those are going in and being passed through the food chain. So this is really, um, really terrible that the base of the food chain is eating plastic. That means the plastic is going all the way through the food chain, meaning that it's not safe to eat fish. And I recommend people don't eat fish. All right, because you're going to be getting those chemicals into your bodies as well. Now, plastic has been getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and now there's nanoparticles of plastic that are able to penetrate the cell membranes. And nanoparticles are very small. They're like the size of, actually even smaller than a red blood cell is how small a nanoparticle is. And what they've found is that nanoparticles can actually go through um, and penetrate your gut and cause leaky gut and lead to things like autoimmune diseases. The fishing industry, um, from our research, we've been researching the sources of plastic marine debris, and we've found that the top polluter is the fishing industry, and next is the aquaculture industry. And ghost nets are nets that, and rope that are just floating around and continuing to fish and to catch marine life and kill marine life. Fish aggregating devices are when the fishing industry deliberately dumps balls of nets and so on into the ocean so that the fish will come under, little fish will accumulate underneath the net and they sometimes put a tracking buoy on it so they can go and find it later um, and catch them, unfortunately. Um, and so the, the thing is that if you're eating fish, then you're supporting an industry that's causing so much harm because they're the top marine debris polluter. And these are some of the pictures of nets and rope on shorelines. As a vegan, it's, in my opinion, okay, this is my opinion, um, it's not just about what you eat or what you wear, but it's also about what industries you're supporting. And so if you do eat and do buy fish, then you're supporting an industry that's causing so much harm. And it's causing harm to coral, you know, to our environment. It's smothering coral and blocking out the sunlight. It's entangling animals and killing them in that way. This is a monk seal caught in a <coughs> rope that's being released that day by a diver, but on another occasion, it was caught in a gill net and was trapped and it suffocated and died from lack of oxygen. On the other side, we've got a monk seal caught in an eel cone, which is from the aquaculture industry. All right, so that's the end of the terrible news. You can go Phew, now, okay, that's it. Um, we're going to get to the solutions. Here we go. So the first thing is avoid all plastic cans and tetra packs for food and drink wherever possible. And particularly, like I said, things that got heated up in some way, baked, roasted, and so on, or oils and acidic items. Your safer choices are glass, porcelain, ceramic, and stainless steel, and even bamboo um, for reusables, or for takeaway containers, clay-coated paper, 100% compostable, or well, they even have palm leaf plates now. You're best off to choose fresh food rather than canned food and not to use plastic in the microwave, as I mentioned. Now, you never want to buy these or use these. Black plastic. Guess what? New thing I learned was that they're made from e-waste. So you know when you recycle all the computers and all that sort of thing? They're making black plastic out of it. Uh-huh. Like this. You want to go home and throw this out, okay? You do not want to, don't go donating this, okay? Throw it out, all right? Because you do not want to be using that ever again. 
It's contaminated with chromium, bromiated flame retardants, chlorine, cadmium, mercury, lead, and antimony. Uh huh. Chewing gum. Did you guys know that the base is plastic in a lot of chewing gum? Okay, you don't want to be doing that. Microbeads. Um, these are the tiny little uh, pieces of plastic added to personal care products like those, but President Obama did sign the act to get rid of them, but guess what? You've got to be careful because it doesn't include everything. All right, so you want to look on the package. These are a lot of names for microbeads, so I'm going to hone that down for you. Here's just five. All right, so when you're going to buy particularly items like skin cream and makeup and sunscreen and so on, those ones may still have microbeads in them. All right, so if you see these words, polyethylene, polypropylene, PMMA, acrylates copolymer, acrylates cross polymer, that's microbeads. That's plastic in your whatever it is, um, shaving cream, toothpaste, etc. Here it is in the toothpaste. Okay, K cups. Now, this is really single use plastic. All right, so wasteful. Terrible idea getting a plastic cup and sticking it in hot water and you got coffee with chemicals, right? Pods, another just awful. I just can't believe that seventh generation would even make this. They're just copying all the other companies that are making it. What? Did they? Okay. Um, anyway, a lot of companies are doing this. They're making dishwasher pods or laundry or even things for the toilet out of this polyvinyl alcohol, which is actually toxic to fish. And it clogs up your machine. So you just really don't want to be using this. So if you have any of these at home, I suggest slit it open, take out the pod, put it in the dishwasher or whatever, throw the plastic away and never buy those again. All right, because there's no magic solution to plastic. It does not dissolve. It does not biodegrade. It does not disappear. No matter what these companies are telling you, that's not the case, okay? HPU on Oahu, they have um, kids in the dormitories, right? The students, they were getting so much clogging of the washing machines with the pods that they had to ban them, all right? And guess what? Dean and I, after a long time, we got a new washing machine because we couldn't fix the old one. And guess what it came with? A packet of pods. <laughs> it's like they want you to have a broken down washing machine. All right, say no thanks. This is a really easy one. Do we need this? Yeah. No, right? Say no, okay, we don't need this. What about this? Plastic straws? No, no. okay, good. All right, reducing. It's really great when you can buy fresh fruit and vegetables that aren't wrapped in plastic. So this is a really good choice. And we've got so much great local food to choose from. And recently we've been seeing this, paper bags and cardboard and so on. This is great. Compostable alternatives. If you are having that party and you do need extra things, then you can look at using compostables that don't contain plastic. They're not made of benzene, styrene, or all those different chemicals. These ones are made from sugar cane, all right? Reusing, so this is the best alternative, is reuse your own straw, um, bag, produce bags, such as this, and you can even um, get a deduction for the weight. You can get a deduction for the weight by they look at the little tag and minus that off the weight. Um, glass bowls when you're getting takeout food or glass bowls when you're bringing the leftovers home. Bamboo reusable utensil sets, your own bottles made of stainless steel. And whenever you can, buy items in glass or stainless steel or bamboo um, instead of plastic, all right? If you've got that choice, go for it. And this is something new I found. Coco Yo, it's coconut yogurt, vegan coconut yogurt in glass. Isn't that great? Baby food in glass, terrific. And bamboo utensils, great. And this is a stainless steel coffee filter. So I'm suggesting that along with reduce and reuse and refuse, 
that we redirect our support and our money and vote with your dollars. So what products and industries as a vegan vegetarian do you support? Do you want to see continue? All right, because whatever you put your money in is what they'll make more of. And just remember that our health and that of the environment are intertwined. So one affects the other. So if you're making a healthy choice, then that'll be healthy for the environment and for marine life as well, and vice versa. If you make the unhealthy choice, then that will harm marine life. And as I said before, being a vegan, it's about, I think, not harming other beings. And by choosing away from plastic, you're actually helping those other species to survive. Our choices, including what we eat and what we buy, make a difference in protecting our health, marine life, and that of our ocean planet. So I hope you'll join us today in taking action. We've got a few different action items for you, which I'm going to start right away as we take some questions and answers. But thank you very much for your attention. OK, so these are items we had at home, organic minestrone soup. Underneath this is a letter to that company. And we are sign getting people to sign this. We're going to send it right when we get back home. All right, so I'd love all of you to sign this letter. It's telling the company, please make this soup in glass. Put it in a glass bottle, because we're now aware of Tetra Packs and the harm that they're doing. So I'm going to hand this around. Where's the pen? If you guys would like to sign. There you go, thank you. Right, the next one is coconut water in a Tetra Pak. Same letter, asking them for, to take action and to change it from um, Tetra Pak to glass. All right, so I'm going to keep the letters going this way so you don't get confused because I want everyone to sign it, each one if you can, please. Can I just put that on your lap? All right, you guys can swap. Yeah, terrific. Okay, and then the next one we have here is butternut squash soup. This is organic. Everything I'm showing you is organic. All right, so we've got the same letter going to that company. Now, the aim of this, the aim of this is that hopefully by next year, this time next year, hopefully they won't be making this anymore. If we all take action, and if you guys all tell a lot of people, we send this letter, tell everyone on social media, all right, we might be able to make a difference. All right, this was not our product. This was someone else's, but this is almond breeze, almond milk. All right, so I'm going to send that one around as well. I know, you guys are busy. All right. I know, that's why I want to go that way. All right. Okay, now, who has some questions? And we need to be pretty quick. Yes, and I'm just going to hand out some um, plastics brochures while we're taking questions. Yes. Okay, so the question is about pills. As far as I know, they're made of cellulose if they're the vegetarian kind. So it's not really plastic, it's, it's made of plants. All right, but you can, you want to be careful as a vegan because sometimes um, they're made of um, horses hooves, you know, and I would, I would definitely break that apart and not, not ingest that. All right, um, more questions. And by the way, I've got a, an action item handout for you guys. So this has got a lot of the suggestions on it. And you, got, you don't have to do all of the suggestions on here today. Just pick one that you can do today because we can't delay this. We've got to take action now, okay? All right. Um, I think I had a question right here. Oh, as far as I know, testing is very expensive. So, no. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay, another question. Yes. Um, banning which kind of items? 
all the plastic. Excuse me, could you uh, speak louder? Okay. Dean, could you run this outside for me to get comments, please? I think, I think the question was, is there any effort to ban plastic items on the island? Yes. Yeah. Right. So we've got plastic bag ban on Kauai, um, and then the styrofoam ban is on a couple of other islands, and Honolulu is working on Bill 40, which is going to ban a lot of things like utensils and straws and so on. So you want to <coughs> Kauai banned uh, plastic bags around five years ago, and that mm -hmm. made a tremendous difference. Mm -hmm. There are some very strong rumblings from both the administration here and the council of banning styrofoam and single-use plastic bottles. So if you know a council member or the mayor, tell him or her, we need it. Uh -huh. So there's some pretty strong... Yes, conflicts. and you know what you guys can do is help support Bill 40. It's got all the way through the Honolulu City Council and it was supposed to be heard on Wednesday and they've held it over. Um, I was flying back just in time and they, they delayed it. So why I'm saying you guys on Kauai support Bill 40, this is why it's important. Because if we can get Bill 40 passed on one island, then it'll be easier for you guys to get the same kind of a law on your island. So Bill 40 will ban straws, stirrers, polystyrene foam containers, lids, cups, a whole lot of things used in eating and drinking. So it's very easy to support that bill. You just go on our website. We'll be announcing when the final hearing is, and we really need everyone's support for that. Thank you. Only recycling, Harley, and only high five plastic is recyclable. Right, right, I know, that's an issue. Worldwide, well, lack of recycling. Yeah, I mean, as I said, you're better off with the glass. All right, another question. Yes. Norway, did you say? Oh, yes, they, they burn the plastic on Oahu for um, electricity, yes. Um, it, kind, it gets rid of 90% and then you've got 10%, Ash. Yes. What about polyester clothing? Oh, sorry, yes. Thank you for bringing that up. What a great question. I didn't mention microfibers. I should have mentioned them today um, because the polyester clothing is made from water bottles. And then you stick that in the washing machine and off come all the microfibers and there's no collection of that because they're too tiny. All right, so you want to stay away from... Um, plastic clothing as much as you can and, and use the um, better kinds of materials like organic cotton, organic bamboo, you know, things like that for sure. All right, any other questions? Okay, one at the back. Is that the last one? Yeah, I know that that's an issue as well. It, it is tough. Yes, you just have to do the best you can to pick whatever you can. All right, so I'm going to leave um, the question, any more questions, I'll see people outside. But I'd like to bring up Cynthia because she wants to say a few words about Surf Rider on Kauai. So thank you. Oh, right. That was very nice. Thank you. So I made a, a video recording of Suzanne's presentation, and it will be available in two to three to four weeks. Uh, if you go to YouTube, uh, Vegetarian Society Kauai, it will come up. If you go to Facebook, Vegetarian Society of Kauai, Kauai Chapter, it will go up. If you Google it, you'll, you'll find it. Uh, if you're on our e email list, I'll send out a link in three or four weeks, and you'll be able to see it again and have uh, more fun with it. Sharon. I think you can hear me in the back. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yes. Strong voice. Okay. How many of you all are familiar with Survivor here in Hawaii? I thought it would be a good number of you. Yes. We're active. Very active chapter. Um, we have four main programs. Two of them are reactive and two are proactive. The two reactive programs are our marine debris program. And I'm going to talk in a moment for a few minutes about that. I'm not going to talk very long, so we need to all get going. <laughs> Two minutes about the marine debris. And the other reactive program we have is the Blue Water Task Force. We're going to go out and sample the water and the ocean and the ditches and check for cleanliness. And the two proactive programs we have are ocean-friendly restaurants, where we certify restaurants as being ocean-friendly. 
We have on our website, you can go in. These are restaurants that all agree to not use any plastic takeout containers. They don't have um, straws. There's many criteria for it. Um, and the other one is one of my programs, which is Ocean from the Gardens, where your garden can be um, certified, as uh, Carol's is there back there. She's nodding. So we have two signs. <laughs> she proudly displays in her home in Lahui that her yard is ocean friendly. So I have some information about those programs out back. Marine debris, Suzanne you know, did an excellent job of leading into the problem. Many of those photos of the beaches really could be our beaches in Hawaii. Um, the Camilla Point on the Hawaii Island, as she didn't mention, it's miles to get to on a rocky coastline. So you can't get, people don't drive up to Camilla Point like they do to Moa'a. Our, our young friend, it looks like, has left to brought up the Moa'a Bay can look like that if we don't clean it up. We clean up the beaches all the time with volunteers, with other organizations. Sir Kruger is active with that. And we started measuring it about five years ago. We're getting 10,000 pounds every month of marine debris on our east shore facing beaches, like five tons every month. Like it or not, rain or shine, it's actually worse than it's raining. <laughs> but five tons a month is coming in. So if you can picture the Hawaiian Islands, we all know that they run east-west, and they also I'm going to do it oriented right for you guys. But they also run north south. So um, Hawaii is not only the westernmost island, it's the northernmost island. And it's like a sieve just catching that marine debris out of the gyre. So our beaches, well, beachgoers and locals and residents are like are pretty good about picking up stuff in the beaches. The ocean is just dumping stuff out. We are bottle and surf riders. You don't have to go out to the gyre to get the ocean, to get the stuff out of the ocean. It's bringing it into us. So with that, um, we have really opportunities to come out and join us. We go out every week, multiple times a week for beach cleanups. It's actually pretty fun. We have food and fun doing it. And I have information out on the back that um, for the month of November, we're going to be out on the rocky coastline of Anahola. We often go to beaches you may never have been to before, backcountry beaches, to clean it up and haul in that, that stuff. Um, the other group that we haven't talked about here today that I feel we really should is Zero Waste Hawaii. They're, this group is just a fledgling group of volunteers, like we're volunteers as a writer and like they are at the, our friends at the beach, who are just doing a lot to get people in. If you would remember, I remember a few years ago, you'd go to a big event and there were water bottles passed out. It still happens. But more and more, you see big events bring the containers and you can fill your own water bottle. That's your always Hawaii doing that. So I you know, applaud their efforts. And uh, I, I know that they're you know, really able to do something here on island about us using less plastic. Um, we're quite, another group I want to mention is the uh, Global Ghost Gear Initiative with those uh, um, of that 10,000 pounds a month, I should say, over half of that by weight is fishing nets. Just like those pictures that Suzanne showed, we get in tons of fishing nets that you don't see on the beach because we're taking them in, we're hauling them out and sending them to the dump. We used to send them to ancient power to be burned, but that goes back up in the air, so that's a longer story I won't go into. So fishing nets, and then the second highest 25%, 50% of that 10,000 pounds is fishing nets. 25% is plastic related to the fishing industry. That's the buoys and those crates they have. And she showed some of those tracks and things that all comes in and out of the ocean. So we have joined the Global Ghost Care Initiative out of Ocean Conservancy. And I, we highly respect Ocean Conservancy, who, who really does a lot for protecting our oceans. The last thing Surfrider does that I want to mention is they get school kids out. We have field trips of getting school kids out and we pay for the buses and get them out to, to go clean beaches with us. And then they come home and they talk to their family about it. We feel education is one of the biggest things we can do about this topic. To just let's start by not having so many water bottles here. So uh, please join us if you would like to volunteer. I have a sheet out there of opportunities that we are um, out on the table. I have we many, many uses. We're very active, very busy. I was recruited by someone here in this room that I had coffee with. I said I want to get involved. Somehow to help the ocean, what should I do? And he said, join Surf Rider, and that would be Robert Zelkowski. Yeah. <laughs>